This is the Less Insurance Dependence Podcast Show with my good friend Gary Takas and myself, Narain Arul Raja. We appreciate your listenership, your time, and most of all, we appreciate your intention to reduce insurance dependence in your practice. Our goal is to provide information that will help you successfully reduce insurance dependence and convert your practice into a thriving and profitable dental practice that provides you with personal, professional, and financial satisfaction. Welcome to another episode of the Less Insurance Dependence Podcast. Uh, very excited. You know that we're mixing up our format now and again uh, on the Less Insurance Dependence Podcast by bringing in some guests. And today we are very privileged to have a special guest, uh, Dr. Bill Hang. Uh, Bill, uh, uh, good to uh, good to see. I'm happy, seeing you uh, here. Happy to be here. Happy uh, to help right where well, I can. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and we're going to do a, a great uh, podcast uh, episode uh, all away, all about airway awareness, airway awareness. But before we get to that interview, I have a quick announcement to make. Uh, coming up on February 1st, 2025, uh, we have a Thriving Dentist live workshop happening in Austin, Texas. Uh, this workshop is all about uh, eight hours on, on a Saturday, uh, all about uh, everything you need to know, drinking from a fire hose to develop a thriving practice, one that provides personal, professional, and financial satisfaction. The last live workshop I did uh, was late February 2020, and we had a full schedule of workshops for the rest of the year in 2020, and COVID uh, had something to do with us having to, to uh, postpone those. Well, we're redoing, uh, we're restarting our live workshops. The first one's going to be in Austin, Texas, February 1st. Uh, you can go to thrivingdentist.com forward slash Austin to register. Eight hours of CE. Imagine drinking from a fire hose about everything you need to know to develop a thriving practice. Come join us. Uh, I'll be the speaker. Austin, we chose Austin because it's somewhat central, at least as East West goes, uh, somewhat central in the country, but it's also a great city. If you've been to Austin, you know how cool the city is. It gives you an excuse to go back. If you've never been to Austin, now's your excuse to go visit. So come early, stay late, and uh, join us for the Thriving Dentist Live Workshop. Now, with no further ado, uh, let's have this discussion about airway awareness. Uh, so uh, first of all, Bill, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, I know you're passionate about this topic. Uh, is that a fair statement? Uh, that's an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'm obsessed with it. Okay, uh, Many of our listeners will know who you are. Um, uh, but for those that have been lurking in the shadows and they don't know who you are, would you be kind enough to share a little bit of your background with them so they know who you are? Well, I'm happy to. Uh, I graduated dental school at the top of my class in 1970. That wasn't because I was the smartest guy, but I worked harder than anyone else. And I, that was actually a penalty because I thought I knew everything. Uh, I went on to orthodontic training and was trained in ortho at the University of Minnesota. And I taught for, uh, for about a year. But then I really wanted to be in practice. So I went into practice and I did everything like I was taught. Uh, I took out teeth by the truckload and straightened teeth. I didn't know what a face looked like. I'd never heard of airway. But in the in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, there were people saying, you know, you're messing up faces, causing TMJ problems. And I began to listen. Make a long story short, I stopped taking out teeth. And I, I had a 10-year saga of doing continuing education uh, throughout the 80s. Uh, and in that, so in that time frame, I changed everything. I began to question literally everything about what I'd learned, which was very challenging because uh, I had accepted it without really even questioning at all. But now, where I am now, I basically question everything. And uh, airway has become the focus of everything I do. Uh, it is the goal of optimizing airway and facial balance. Uh, I really got aware of it in uh, about 1992 when I had a 35-year-old woman who was in my practice and I had been treating her TMJ problem with an appliance that postured her jaw forward. And that appliance broke and she came to me in tears and she said, Dr. Hang, I, you know, when I came to see you, I was suicidal. I never told you that. And I felt so great with this appliance. Uh, but when it broke, I went back to feeling the way I did when I came to see you. I felt like I was going to drown or choke to death. 
That was a turning point in my practice right there. I thought a light bulb went off. What is she saying? And I went and looked at her lateral head x-ray and I saw that her airway was very small, although I didn't even know how big it should be. I saw that the space between the back of her tongue and the back of her throat was minuscule. Called my surgeon friend and I said, Todd, how big should that space be? Well, it should be 10 or 11 millimeters. Well, this was like two or three. Mm. That was really a huge turning point in my, in my career right there. Wow. Um, I want to put some context in this for, for our listeners. You know, um, if you're a regular listener to Less Insurance Dependence podcast, you know that uh, I'm very fond of encouraging uh, dentists to add what I like to call high value services. Um, these are uh, services that are kind of outside of everyday general dentistry. Uh, things like, say, placing implants, placing restoring implants. Cosmetic dentistry might be another example of cosmetic dentistry. But I would absolutely put uh, airway management in that same category. And the reason it fits the context of this podcast is that uh, patients will ask whatever this treatment is that we might suggest for, for airway management. They'll ask if insurance is going to cover it. That's a fair question. Would you agree? Uh, oh, no, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But they're not surprised when we say, well, your insurance was only meant to cover the most basic things, and this is anything but basic. Uh, they aren't necessarily thrilled with that answer, uh, but uh, they often are at a point of frustration uh, where uh, they want to do something ab about it, uh, and they're very motivated. Um, and, you know, if, if you also, as a regular listener, you, you know how passionate I am about our profession. Uh, Bill, I like to say that dentistry rocks. And the reason I believe it rocks is we have the ability to change people's lives every day. Um, whether it be, you know, maybe you have a patient that comes to you with some very compromised, well, as an orthodontist, you saw this all the time. Uh, maybe you're, you're treating a, a teen that, that had a very awkward uh, a smile and you transformed uh, that smile into something beautiful and it changed their life. Uh, but it could be behavioral. It could be uh, maybe we just have a patient that, that needs a, a empathetic set of ears to, to listen to them. Um, and, uh, I like to say dentistry rocks because we can change people's uh, lives every day, but there also are opportunities. You know, we don't think of dentistry as being life-saving like our colleagues say in the ER. Uh, we know the colleagues in the ER are, de are dealing with life-saving. However, dentistry absolutely can be life-saving, especially in the topic of airway management. H have I, um, have I over sensationalized it, Bill, or is that accurate? Not at all. When I was 15 and decided to become a dentist, I, I decided to become a dentist. One of the reasons not to be a physician was I didn't want people to be dealing with life or death. But in reality, in the last 30 years of my practice, I was dealing with that, with people with the airway issues uh, who could easily die early. Untreated sleep apnea, for instance, carries with it a penalty of 20% reduction in life expectancy. And I got, I mean, I had any number of patients who would come to me, thank you for saving my life because I recognized that problem and had a way to treat it and helping working with other people who had any number of people who feel that we saved their lives by reopening previous orthodontic extraction spaces, for instance, which we've been doing since 1989, had people from more than 30 states uh, that I treated uh, in several foreign countries for that very issue. Point is there, the people are, you're completely right. People are willing to move mountains to have something that they think is going to help their life, uh, whether it's insurance related or you know paid for or not, they're uh, the, the most the best patients in this regard are the mothers who've had four by cusp of teeth taken out. They're not happy with their crushed in faces, their temperament, or joint issues, which they think are related, and their sleep and breathing issues. They'll they'll move mountains for their kids and they'll move mountains for themselves to have something done. And talk about uh, loyal patients. Um, you know, one of the things that I like to say about, uh, you know, insurance uh, dependent patients, certainly we can get a good patient from Delta. We can get a good patient from Blue Cross Blue Shield, from uh, name any one of them, Aetna, whatever. But oftentimes they, they arrive with baggage and, and the baggage is they're only interested in having something none of it's covered by insurance. But when you've right. made an impact on the quality of their life, uh, they are deeply uh, appreciative and absolutely connected to your practice. Um, but let's go a little bit of de deeper. Uh, some of our listeners uh, may be, you know, I imagine that the spectrum of airway awareness runs the full spectrum among our listeners. Uh, yeah. we have, we have listeners, by the way, uh, it's, it, it's kind of crazy. Um, uh, most of our listeners are right here in the United States. 
Uh, yeah. However, we we actually have listers in 188 countries, which is, oh, wow. is, is kind of crazy. Um, but I imagine the spectrum is is varied. Um, what are some health problems uh, associated with airway issues? If we can kind of take a broad overview like that, what are some health health issues associated with airway? Well, yeah. I, I like to quote John Remmers, David Gozal, or these are these are giants in the uh, in the airway field. Uh, and basically, every chronic disease is associated with airway issues. Everyone, uh, John Remmers is one who said it's it's the most uh, common uh, growing problem in all industrialized countries. You have heart attack, stroke, uh, diabetes, uh, Alzheimer's, cancer. Literally everything is associated in one way or the other. You, if you read Patrick McCune's book, The Breathing Cure, you'll understand just how big of a deal it is. Patrick's my good friend and uh, my a patient of mine too. We go back a long time, uh, but it's out there. It is. It's correlates with everything. The interesting thing is, it's the awareness was not even new. Back in the 1800s, uh, Charles Dickens described uh, sleep apnea without naming it. But there was awareness. Uh, George Catlin was a uh, was a, a American artist in the American West, and he wrote a book, "Shut Your Mouth and Save Your Life." This really had to do with proper restoral posture, nasal breathing versus mouth breathing, and in reality, it all hinges on getting the face to grow forward. Even the ancient Chinese medicine, uh, they said people who have a recessed jaw will, don't don't live to a long don't live a long life. So ancient Chinese medicine recognized this hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So it's not like it's new. What you may not know is that orthodontists were expanding both arches in the early 1900s. And why were they doing it? For health reasons, had nothing to do with teeth. They talked about what we would today call, uh, you know, brain damage, but they, they, they called retardation. Of course, nobody wants to use that term today. It's a bad term, but they were treating it uh, Dr. Bogue and others in the early 1900s are in the literature about that. So it's not like something is new. And yet I I was taught in ortho training that you couldn't expand the lower arch. There's no suture. You can't do it. Well, I met someone uh, in 1985 who said you could. And so I went home to my practice and had two great little uh, guinea pigs named David and Daniel. They're my sons. And we did them and they're now 48 and 46 and uh, I didn't push their teeth off the bone support. And uh, one of my grandkids has had this treatment as well. Wow. It's a very personal, uh, a very personal experience in your own family. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, James Nestor's book uh, has a New York Times bestseller. Um, it, I, I believe uh, has put a lot of awareness out there among the public. Uh, uh, about uh, sleep, uh, sleep apnea and, and related airway issues. Um, one of the things that I've heard a lot from doctors that are incorporating airway uh, awareness and airway management in their practice is the, the number of patients that um, aren't comfortable uh, or, or, or refuse to, to use a CPAP machine. Um, <laughs> and oftentimes we hear it, you know, the patient says, uh, I went to one of those sleep centers and they shouldn't call it that because no sleeping went on. Uh, you know, I was hardwired and there was no sleep, but they did a sleep test. I was determined, it was determined that I have sleep apnea. I was recommended to a sleep physician and they recommend a CPAP and I'm never going to wear it. Um, is that a common uh, situation among the population? From what I understand from sleep physicians that I know, probably fewer than half that are told or given a CPAP machine will wear it long term. And then, then the bad news comes from uh, a study that was from the University of Flinders in Australia, I believe. I think it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. I think it was seven years ago. I, I Don't quote me on that. Okay. Was uh, talked about how the, uh, CPAP does not provide a statistical benefit of reducing the chance of heart attack or stroke. It makes you feel better in the morning, but it's not a cure. And I, when I talk about it, I say, yeah, it's a Band-Aid. Uh, and it's wrong with the Band-Aid. Band-Aids are useful. But to help to think that someone is going to wear one long term and have a benefit from it is is a big stretch. And those who have had one and and then suddenly with whatever we've been able to do, whether it's maxillomandibular advancement surgery or what, and they suddenly breathe normally, and uh, then they, they realize that the CPAP machine was nothing more than life support for them. And uh, I mean, I've seen blood pressure drop dramatically from like 163 over 128 
uh, a, a guy who's been, a, I had a patient like that uh, actually, who had been a, a, seen a, a cardiologist and was on meds for four years when he came to see me. And that was his blood pressure. When I took it, I, I said, you need to, you need treatment and you need it now. I told him he needed to get a sleep study. He had it done and he desaturated to 65% oxygen saturation, at which point the sleep clinic woke him up and sent him home. And you can figure out why they wanted to do that. I think they didn't want to have him die in their in their right. clinic. That would add publicity. We ended up doing orthodontics, a very unique plan for surgery. And indeed, he had the treatment done. 10 days post-surgery, he emailed me from where he was because the surgery was not done in Los Angeles area where I, where I practiced. Uh, he said that his blood pressure had dropped to 120-something over 70-something within 10 days post-surgery. Blew me away. So truly normalized. And I mean, the first reading you totally gave- Totally normalized with nothing. And, his, and his, his, his cardiologist had never even asked him if he snored, much less uh, suggested a sleep study. And here I am, a crazy orthodontist that was the one who told him to, to get a sleep study. And when he had got it done, he didn't need any motivation. He saw how bad it was. And interestingly, I got an email from him uh, this July. It was the, uh, I believe it was the sixth or seventh anniversary of his surgery. He and his wife, his new wife, who wouldn't have looked at him, he had no chin, uh, standing in front of the uh, Golden Gate Bridge and thanking me for saving his life. Wow. Uh, makes me makes me feel very good. I was going to say, it makes you feel very good, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, the range of um, treatment modalities that, that a dentist could choose to incorporate in, in his or her practice, you know, with a massive amount of CE, um, right. really runs a whole gamut. But right. I know we have many listeners that this is going to strike a nerve uh, in a positive right. way with them. Where would be the best place to get started or, or where would be some ways for our listeners to get started uh, in their uh, uh, airway awareness journey? Well, I not to be big headed, but I don't know a better place than with me. I'm semi-retired and uh, I'm a I'm a workaholic and I I. I, I said I would never retire, but I'm not really retired. I have two mentorships. One is called ECHO, E-C-H-O, Early Childhood Health-Centered Orthotics, where we're trying to uh, uh, help people understand how to treat really young kids. The big focus of that is treating in the primary dentition, literally like the profession was doing more than 100 years ago. We're treating really young kids prior to, they, uh, my goal is to make it so that they would never wear braces. By age six, they wouldn't need braces. Their teeth would be coming in normally. Now that's a big bill to fill, but that's the focus we have treating the primary dentition. And we have kids who Ron, you know, um, Ron Harper is a PhD neurobiologist at UCLA has documented the, the brain damage that's occurring for kids that with even one night of oxygen desaturation. There's plenty of data out there. We're dealing with a serious issue. A good friend of mine, Phil Cooper, African-American dentist in Savannah, Georgia has written a book titled Why Af African-American Kids Can't Read. It has nothing to do with the color of their skin. It has to do with many of them have sleep apnea and brain damage, and it doesn't matter the color of your skin. Point is, we can't continue to ignore this. We have a health implications of this that are monstrous. That's what our focus is and the ECHO program. Um, and it's a mentorship program that we have. And I, every morning I wake up and I'm answering a, a, a posts from the people who are in it. Then the next other men, and that's for kids age 10 and under. And uh, it's it's very popular. And uh, I've got some really good people that I, I'm mentoring throughout the country that I can refer to, but I certainly need more. In the age 10 and over, that becomes more complex. Uh, most of those are what I call extraction, retraction, regret syndrome people. And you say, well, what's that all about? E-R-R-S. Well, it's a it's a, a very real syndrome that I uh, have uh, have named uh, ERRS as a mistake because in my opinion it's a mistake to retract and I I you know we've known for years that our faces are back and uh, you know Daniel Lieberman Harvard anthropologist Robert Corcini Southern Illinois University anthropologist talk about how our faces are back from where our ancestors were and that's why you know uh, uh, people say. Uh, 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 John Remmers, this is a classic for him. He said, we would, wouldn't have sleep apnea if our jaws were forward where they're supposed to be. But here we are still pulling everything back. So that mentorship really focuses on 
with something that I started doing in September of 1989, believe it or not, reopening previous orthotic extraction spaces. I even done it in my own mouth, as a matter of fact. Uh, and that we've that's a huge part of what we do. Uh, and we teach the differential diagnosis, what to, what to, will it be successful or not? Sometimes it will, and many times it won't. There are times when the only way out of that, that, uh, place is, uh, M MMA surgery to advance both jaws. And right. I've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of surgical cases in my career. I went to a ortho program where I got plenty of ex uh, experience doing surgery. I went to the operating room with 10 of my own cases, even in, as a resident, so I've had lots of experience. I see what works and what doesn't work. But we try to incorporate all of that. That's really for people who have, have had a fair amount of experience. But it's all about people who want to make a difference. And of course, I'm not going to promise anybody a result. Anybody who promises a result in dentistry is a fool, uh, in my humble opinion. Uh, I, I'm an Eagle Scout, so I put my hand up like this. I, <laughs> I promise to do my I'll best. Be your witness. I'll be your witness. I, I, want to, I promise to do my best. And then I say... You know, if you're willing to go through the treatment with me, that's great. I've, I'll, I've never promised resolution of one symptom, never would. But I never treat a case unless I'm 99.99% sure I'm going to be successful. But I got to be real clear about that. And that's in my mentorships. Uh, that's what I try to do is to help. My goal with my mentorship is to make it so that they don't need me, that they can make their choices. So it's not about answering the question. It's about helping them understand the, the reason for the answer of the question. Going to the class. It'll resonate with you, with your Panky Institute uh, mm -hmm. background. Uh, Bill, where can our listeners get information about your mentorships? Uh, it's called or orthotohealth.com. O-R-T-H-O-2, the number two, H-E-A-L-T-H. -E Ortho-2, as in oxygen, O-2. <laughs> That's one of those things that I thought about when I was out running, you know? <laughs> My, my mind only works when I'm running. I, I'm an addicted runner, and you can relate, I'm sure. Bill and I share a, a common interest in uh, <laughs> distance running, and we uh, had a wonderful discussion before we hit record today about that. Again, that's ortho, O-R-T-H-O, the number two, health.com. Yes, uh, we're going to put that in the show notes, uh, but also uh, if you're listening to this and you're on the go, just an easy, easy website to go find. I want to encourage you all to go to... Uh, Bill's website. Bill, as we put a ribbon around it today, uh, one thing that's clear is uh, I need to get you back on the podcast and do a longer discussion about this because we just barely touched uh, uh, touched the nerve on it. But uh, uh, I want to thank you. Thanks for uh, for your passion around uh, making a difference. And uh, okay. thanks for all that you do for our profession. Wow. Uh, I know that you have succeeded in sparking an interest in many of our listeners, and now they can have a pathway uh, to begin their journey uh, uh, to uh, add this to their practice. Uh, and uh, I'm excited to see where this goes because as I said before, dentistry rocks. Uh, we get the ability to change people's lives uh, every day. And, and on occasion we get the ability to save lives. And this is one of those areas that that latter um, situation is, is true. Um, so thank you. And thanks for, for being right. with us on this podcast episode. Uh, also, want to thank all of our listeners. Uh, before I do that, though, quick reminder, um, come join me in, in Austin, Texas, uh, February 1st, 2025, for our, our uh, Thriving Dentist Live Workshop, eight hours of CE. Uh, look forward to uh, seeing you there. Go to thrivingdentist.com uh, forward slash Austin. On that note, thank you all for the privilege of your time. We look forward to connecting with you on the next Less Insurance Dependence podcast.